Here. Brooks. Here. Here. Harris. Here. Martha. Here. Moran. Eustace. Here. Ogella. Summers. Here. 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 Here.
here. Uh, so, so even though the uh, and this right now it's uh, Mr. Harvey. So just because he's not in the building doesn't mean he's not available. Like you said, 24/7, he has to respond. Uh, uh, and I would assume that you know, in certain instances, he responds like he's in the building, right? I mean, he either says, "Okay, I'll come right on over." Or, okay, I'll get on that or whatever. So I'm making the point that that even though the corporate, you know, the counsel to the executive uh, may be part time in the building, doesn't mean he's part time in the job. Right. Yeah. Now, one of the things I think that does make a difference, and I have no problem with it, is but it does allow the executive council uh, to also do other work. It doesn't, he's not necessarily exclusive or he's not prohibited from doing outside work, correct? That is correct. I'm asking the, the previous I, I would assume he has to be careful of anything that could be a conflict. Absolutely. But, but, he, but, but he's not prohibited. The, he or she is not prohibited. Legal, the first legal work. council was a full-time position and we determined that we didn't need a full-time, you know, every single day, all day, but we, so we reduced that salary when Jim came on and allowed for outside work as long as it didn't create a conflict. Okay. Sure. So, 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 yeah, I guess I want to make the point is, is that it's a professional job, professional service. It doesn't, you know, it's because you're perhaps waiting for the front or uh, uh, determined on a part-time basis. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not available 24-7. So Jim, I plan on calling you at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, to okay. see if you're on the job. Okay. You know, okay. Right. I just the thing people need to remember is that FaceTime and work time are not the same thing. Okay. Very often people are working whether you see them or not. Sure. <clears throat> Any other questions? So they have been on the table, so we need a motion to remove it from the table. Okay. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so we move that forward to motion. Uh, are we motion to approve? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So that goes forward. Was there any other old business? In the new business section, we're going to do three pieces of new business all at the front end. The first piece will be the tax abatement for Supermarket Conwell Hill. Uh, and we've done, and um, Derek, are here for that one? Back up. Good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Pryor. I'm with the Will County Center for Economic Development. I have with me Derek Conley uh, from the City of Joliet. And we also have representatives from the applicant with us today um, in the gallery who can answer any questions as well. Um, in your packet, you have an abatement application from Supermercado El Huero, um, which is seeking to complete the project at 118 East Jackson Street in Joliet. Uh, they are a full-service operator of grocery stores. They currently have six sites, three in Chicago, two in Aurora, and one in Crest Hill. They are seeking to fill the existing certified foods building. Um, and I, I won't go too deep into the details on the, on the project itself. Derek can answer it. But this, this is a project that the city of Joliet has been uh, seeking a new grocer for that site for some time and to contemplate not just the supermarket but a rehab of the entire space. Um, the CED's role in this, uh, City of Joliet did reach out to us after seeking uh, partners to redevelop this site. Um, the CED, as the administrator of the abatement program for the county, uh, took in the application uh, from the supermarket, scored the application. It did meet the minimum thresholds um, based on the county's scoring for a three-year 50% of abatement. And again, that application is in your packet. Um, 
the project itself, the total project costs are currently estimated at roughly six million dollars. Job creation is, is roughly 85 jobs at full build, 50 of which would be full time. Um, the ask for this project is a three-year abatement. Um, the three-year 50% abatement would be focused strictly on the building portion of this property, not the lot. And from a county perspective, the existing tax bill for this property is currently under $2,000 a year. It's, it's a relatively modest property tax bill. Um, after, after the improvements are made, the estimate uh, from the Township Assessor's Office is such that we would expect that during the abatement period, should it be granted, the property tax bill for the county would move to just over $2,000 a year, and at full bill, it would be roughly $4,000 a year. Uh, the other taxing bodies involved in this project are, of course, City of Joliet, which is offering a significantly more robust um, package for the company. Uh, high School District 204 and Grade School District 86. Uh, grade School District was the first to approve. They approved last night. Uh, the High School District will review this again on the 19th. And City of Joliet has passed the abatement through their Economic Development Committee and full Zerfo Council will consider it later this month. Um, you, you know, for the sake of brevity, and maybe we'll, we'll leave off there, I can certainly introduce Derek to answer any questions about the City of Joliet's role in the project. And certainly if we have any questions for the applicant, they're here with us as well. Yes. My question is involving the 45 new full-time positions. I'm just curious what the average wage of those full-time positions are. It's in there. Um, I didn't see it's it. my question, too. Oh, I always forget to scroll. It's $19,700. Yeah, I got my calculator. Did you have another question, Jackie? 19000 is what I'm seeing here is the average wage. $9.70 an hour. $9.70 an hour? Uh, I have jobs, $12 an hour, um, <laughs> but um, do they include benefits of any kind? So they, they do offer health uh, to their full-time employees. Do they pay for it or does... I, I, I don't know what the break is on their health care benefits. Um, certainly they're, they're here with us and we can let them respond. Because my concern was that these jobs were not the kind of high quality jobs that we're looking for in our community. And that if we give a tax abatement, no matter how small, it seems like we're setting a setting a, a stage um, to just give away tax money for the piddliest little job. Next thing you know, we'll be giving a tax abatement to the Lyft driver. I, just my personal thought on it. Thank you. Yeah, that was my concern in light of what we learned at legislative about a living wage. And like you said, we're not abating a lot of tax, but we're giving tax to somebody, and the employees aren't even really going to be making a living wage. So I have Probably. a problem with us giving money to somebody to pay uh, some standard payment. Yeah, I have some similar concerns. First, let me say that we need entry level jobs also. I, I understand that everybody has to start somewhere. And, and indeed, I operated businesses for 40 years where a portion of the employees were entry level employees. We know they didn't make the minimum wage. It was, you know, maybe 50 cents above or a quarter above. Of course, I'm going back to the minimum wage was different. But, but, uh, uh, but yet, when we incent, but but generally we don't incentivize those types of jobs. And indeed, even the city of Joliet over years have, have uh, expressed concern about jobs that were 12, 13, 14, 15 dollars an hour. That they weren't the type of jobs that necessarily we were looking for. Uh, um, and I think it's great that they're coming. I'm a little surprised the school district uh, agreed to uh, give me benefits, so I guess that's. Uh, uh, but I have 
have some concern about about sending maybe a little a message. Uh, we're, we're kind of talking on both sides. On one side, we get we get here and we say, well, you, you know, the warehouse industry, they're not paying and they're not giving benefits, and you know, they're only paying twelve dollars an hour or thirteen dollars an hour, whatever, and. and and uh, we shouldn't be giving, they don't need any help, we should be no longer incentivizing them, but now we're going to do this. I, I, I have to say that you may need to make a little different argument. You know, if, 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 if this fills a real need, you know, we hear the term food deserts frequently, and certainly, uh, even where I live, you know, to the, to, to the east of where I live, it's kind of like a food desert. For what reason, I don't know. So they all come uh, uh, to the, you know, they have to drive over to the uh, shop. But, uh, you know, if that's part of the reason you're doing this, and it's just not pure, it certainly is not economics. Uh, and you, you know, because if you're saying this is purely on economics, I'm not going to support it. You, know, you have to make it a little different argument to me. So they let you know that. If, if I might respond to that, if that's okay. So certainly that, that's part of the conversation in this case. In fact, it, it's, it's the primary driver of, of the ask on this particular deal. This is um, something that certainly falls outside of what we would normally look at in abatement space. Now, to, to be clear, it, it, it did meet the minimum threshold within our, our current scoring model, but driven primarily by it, you know, new tax revenues, um, total investment in the project, and total job creation. Th this type of project does fall outside of the normal scope, if you will, and it was a, a specific ask by the city for that reason. And you alluded to food deserts, that certainly was part of the conversation with the city's economic development committee earlier this week. And, and again, it, it was definitely a specific target attempting to fill a, a very specific need on that side of town for the municipality. So it, it, it really does take on what I would say is a different a different tenor than some of the other projects that we've looked at in the past. So, so it fills a void that goes beyond just pure economics. Very much so. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Julian then this this appears to me to be a project that fulfills those needs exactly. Um, this is important in a community. This type of a, a providing a grocery store that local residents who may not drive, um, it, it, it's providing a need, and it will also these markets. We have several in our district. Um, they they create a lot of revenue. They're they're very popular. Um, they're very important. So there's a lot of people in the city who, they don't shop once a week, they shop throughout the week every day. And these local markets fill that need. Uh, I just have one question, however. Um, do you, can you tell us why the certified market went out of business? What led to that? <coughs> Ooh, um, I mean, certainly, you know, the, the argument would be made for market conditions driving them out of business. And, and to be candid, you know, we, we lost two stores um, on the east side of Joliet. And they're for 18 months? About two years ago. And the city of Joliet has been aggressively working to, to fill those spaces with a, a similar use. And, um, it, you know, to your point, why did they leave the market conditions? And, and those same conditions are, are a big part of the reason why the city has done so much to, to try to, one, identify a partner that was willing to come to the table, and two, find a way to make the effort for that partner. So I would just encourage you to work with them to, to make that environment as a whole more economically dynamic so they all succeed. But I, I do support this. Yeah, so I agree there's a food desert there, but are we all saying that the ends justify the means on the back of the employees? I mean, we can't have it both ways. You can't give us uh, a seminar on how wages should be up, but because we need a food, we're in a food desert, that's okay, you can pay the employees less. Everybody keeps saying it's going to generate a lot of revenue, but not for the employees. 
they're still going to be making 970 an hour or less because this is the average. So I'm still not understanding how everybody is just ignoring that portion of what the employees are going to make because we need we need a market there, and we're going to generate more revenue for the county or for Joliet or whatever. Then let's just forget about the employees. Hmm. Um, and I can certainly, um, oh, that's her. I can certainly um, see both sides of the argument. Um, certainly, I agree that food is there and there's a need. However, I also know that there are willing workers that are willing, like, to take that job at that rate. That guy is really going to percent. It doesn't sound fair. If you can find them, send them to me because right. I pay more. All right. Well, I would like to get Jackie. I, I will no. tell you that. I will tell you that. I'm going to check my terms. I will tell you that. Um, there are persons, that's in my district, that did tell me they want that supermarket there and they want to work there. Someone is better than no money. I agree with you 100%. But there are willing workers willing to take uh, on that job, and that is a food desert. I don't have to repeat that. That is an area where you're right. Two stores that left that area. And this is a great uh, opportunity to uh, fulfill, instead of a banded building there, put some people to work as well as serve that badly needed community. <clears throat> I certainly understand both sides of the argument. As someone who's been working on these types of deals for nearly 20 years, I often remind myself that we have to be cautious of what our role really is here as county board members or college trustees, mayors, etc. I think at the end of the day, I try to look at the economic development uh, for that community. I think we play a dangerous game when we start trying to legislate based on what an employer is going to pay an employee because I don't really know if that's our role. At the end of the day, if he's paying too low, and, we're not, and he's not getting any employees, well, if they're all going to Jackie's company, he's going to have to increase his, his wages. But I'm not sure that's a, an argument that we need to be involved in at, at the end of the day. I think that community is a diversified group of individuals that are going to look at this type of grocery store uh, in a very positive manner. I think they're going to be successful, and I think they're going to wind up probably increasing wages over time. But at the end of the day, I think it's a needed uh, area. And let's look at the amount of money when we're talking about abatements. You know, we're not talking about uh, a big warehouse project that comes in and wants a $400,000 abatement. We're, we're abating about $1,000. Wait until that price Yeah, I understand that on the form that it's part of the criteria, but when I look at it, I, I look less at the, the wages portion of it because I think in, in the, the society in, in, that we live in, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't want legislators legislating necessarily my wages of what I pay my employees. Uh, but the market conditions kind of play a lot into that. And, and there's no way I could get anyone to work in my place for 970 an hour. I don't know how they're going to do it, but you know, they're going to have to learn that they don't, I guess. Yeah, I have a question. Has any projections been done because the state is talking about a $15 minimum wage that what this company, could they f afford if that state legislation goes into effect? I understand there's increases each year. Can this company afford to do that if that, if that happens, if that happens? They certainly can't speak to whether or not they've attempted to, to forecast what may or may not come out of Springfield. Certainly that's going to augment you know, the, the labor market for, for all of these types of jobs within the retail space. And, and to be candid, you're going to see that cost reflected in other places, most likely, if they need you to afford it. But, but their competition will bear the same burden. It'll be yeah. um, There's a question about the I did some quick math in my head here, and it looks like the total tax uh, exemptions that they're seeking from all taxing bodies, $31,500 or whatever it was, comes to about $0.22 cents an hour. And like like Ray said, 
I've negotiated contracts with companies where they've agreed to pay their entry level employees at three dollars over the minimum wage. They can't find anybody to come work for them at that number. They, they're forced to pay some higher numbers. So I can't. I don't, I don't know if they can find people to work for that amount of money. That's, that's one thing. But I don't think uh, our piece of this pie is like less than a penny an hour or something. The, if we didn't give the abatement, there would make a difference in a person's wages. I think it's significant for the benefit of brings to the community. So. The other thing that I'll add, because it's this, Brooks said it's our district. There are plenty of people in that district who will work at that price or slightly above that. Many of them are homemakers who would be able to go to work and still be able to be home for their children, to send them off to school in the morning, to get them off the bus in the afternoon so it works for them. The other thing that you want to pay attention to is, yes, it's an abatement for the grocery portion of it. They are going to be upgrading more than that. There is a strip mall there. There is a lot of work being done to upgrade the property overall, the look of the property, the parking lot, the building, and the attendant retail space, which will not only help offset the food district, or desert rather, but also offset the look of the community and offer some other opportunities in the rest of that retail space. So those things are there. And what they pay the workers is really on them. So I just want to put that out there. I'm not saying that I like 970, I'm just saying that's going to be on them. If they can get that and um, be able to maintain the level of workers they need at that price, that's, you know, that's going to be be a challenge for them to worry about, not us. Judy. Yeah, so I agree with a lot of what was said here today. Uh, my main thing is that they're making 970 an hour. Are they getting the health care paid for? I mean, as a business owner here today, can you guys speak on that? That's, that's an important thing because I could see a mom, you know, staying home and looking to find a job right there where they can get the hours they want. And if they can get that, that health benefit, that's great. And she's home for her kids, or at least her kids are, she's working like two, three blocks from home. Uh, otherwise, it is an extremely low amount of money. You can go to McDonald's and make more money than that, and um, that seems to be a bit easier job than dealing with everything that goes on at the grocery store. Do you have that answer for us? I, I don't have the answer. I don't know. I, I can invite Andres down here to, to respond to that question if you like. It is in the packet on the application. It says full time health benefits, yes. Retirement, no. Tuition reimbursement, no. Part time, no. So the only one that has health insurance on the application was full time employees. But there's nothing there about what the cost what split the is and what the premium is. Maybe we pay 50%, 70%. At least, and it might be really expensive. Hi, my name is Andres Garcia. I'm the general manager for the little stores. Um, in regards to the wages, as you know, the city of Chicago, every year they go. So we're following that process. Um, our stores in Aurora, we started at 970, but we have certain positions. For example, we have employees that are at 10, 12, 14 dollars, depending on what they do, what experience they have. So it's not 970 straight across. That's a study, but you have experience, depending on you know, if you're going to be a computer you know, person in charge, it's all different. In regards to insurance, we pay half the insurance, and we also pay them a week's vacation also. And our stores in Chicago, we um, also give them sick days. We give them five sick days a year. So, you know, we adjust with, uh, you know, the street, you know, the market. market thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, just wait a minute, because he's had a chance. I just want to say that um, I go to the stores out in Aurora by me. I live up in Aurora, in that <coughs> part of Little County, and, um, and they are great stores. Um, all the residents are really happy that they have something close like that, and um, everybody seems really happy to work here and really helpful. So, I mean, I can see why it would be. I guess everybody's misunderstanding. I'm a free market guy. I have no problem with that. None whatsoever. But we can't have it both ways. We can't have presentations, and I expect we'll never have a presentation then about uh, the wages for the warehouses and the activists that are coming in there. I expect not to see those. Ray, you weren't at the legislative meeting. It was all about the wages being too low, which were at 14 and $15, and how the temporary workers were getting paid. 
we're going to have those kinds of presentations that's got to be applied to this kind of situation. I'm against I'm, I'm against uh, trying to put any kind of limitations or criteria on wages. I don't even believe in, in the way the minimums come out. So I'm all for this project. I'm just saying we can't have it both ways in the county. We, we, we need to have one voice. It can't be by project or by situation. Yes. By um, I don't think there's anything wrong with hearing somebody's opinion about a project or an issue that's going on in our community. We didn't take a vote at that meeting to support anything specific. They were coming to talk to us about temporary workers, nor do we have anything on the agenda coming up to take a vote on either support or lack of support for the temporary worker. So I don't, I mean, there's going to be people all over this county that don't agree with me and don't agree with you, Mike, but that doesn't mean we should just Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. We need to know what's going on. Many members did say on there, we'll support this or whatever what we can. Uh, okay. They may as individuals. Okay, but I, and the point that I just want to make is these are permanent jobs as opposed to temporary yep. jobs, mm -hmm. which makes me feel more comfortable with it. I mean, I understand everybody's arguments here. Make it more on the temporary jobs. Yeah, but I'm just saying that there's an opportunity for growth here. Quite a bit. The, I think Jackie just said a mouthful with the with the temporary worker. A lot of companies bypass a lot of the state unemployment regulations, the federal unemployment regulations, uh, and the benefits opportunities by bringing on temporary. They actually circumvent a lot of the costs that are borne by the employer by putting on a temporary workforce. The permanent workforce, which you do not use temporary work, workers, do you? No. You don't hire from a temp agency, you know, everyone gets a 1090 or W-2 from your company. That's a big difference. Huge. It is. Thank you. Denise. Um, I'm just wanted to point out uh, with my, um, that we, can have ideals and move closer to them by still looking at unique situations. In fact, we're going to have to look at unique situations. The fact this is a food desert, the fact that they have you know, 45 full-time employees and 25 part-time employees that they're putting into an area that Herb talked about, there are needed jobs in that area. And no one there wants to make $9 when they can make $10, of course not. But there aren't any other jobs at this point where they're even paying $8.25, which is the minimum. So although we may want to get to an ideal where we don't have temporary workers, where we have people who have affordable housing and have good pay, we have to take the baby steps to get there. And when you look at all of the other things that are happening in this area with the lack of the, the food in the area, we have to take them into account. We can, it can't just be black and white. We've had quite a bit of discussion, but the question before us is uh, the tax abatement for Supermercado El Guero. I'll call the question. I'll make a motion that we go to the board agenda. Second. Been done yet. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Were there any opposed?
We thank all of you, and thank you so much, Speaker. We really appreciate it, and we're happy to partner with you. So, have a happy Valentine's Day. Thank you.
Yeah. That's no, incorrect. No, At the 215 number, there's a 9.5. Roughly a 9.5. Okay, if there five. was at the 215, we saved $10 million in bidding, which brought it down to 205. The 9.6 should still be there then. Correct. We were 18 point something million dollars when I turned it over at the end of when the, when the board turned. Right. So at 215, we had $9 million in contingency. And we saved $10 million in the bidding, yeah. which is what we understand. And we spent then we're down to 205, but the 9.6 still needs to be there. We didn't use it. I don't have it. I know her. <laughs> I looked in my sock drawer. I mean, this was developed from Gilbane's scope of work. I, I but in Gilbane's numbers, the 9.6 would still be in there. Still there. So when you talked about the eighth and ninth floor, that cost additionally was not in the 250. No, it was it was separate, it is, and it now it's included. And now it's I, included. if you were to include the, the eighth and ninth floor back into the 215, what would that have brought it's already, initially it's already, to? It was originally 495, and then this board voted to add the additional money to make it a 215 all-in complete with the two additional. With the eighth and ninth floor. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you know, let, let me take a little different approach. <clears throat> in, in or out, the contingency. You know, my concern is, is that we're borrowing money that we will not use for at least the price two, two and a half years. In which case, that money sits, we pay the interest and so forth. You know, I understand uh, 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 that there's a parameter ordinance. Uh, that runs out. But because of that parameter ordinance, doesn't that, that necessarily mean we should rush out and bond all the money out at this point that may not be used for some time? You know, I, 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 I'm for going to a smaller amount, uh, do a new bond uh, a parameter ordinance if that's what, what we need to do. And I might add that we can do $10 million a year bank qualified borrowing, where we just go directly to the banks and have them bid to buy, uh, and you can get, and, and that process is pretty streamlined, by the way. So, you know, uh, I, I, I think the contingency, whether it's in or out, I, I, you know, uh, it appears to me that it's in, uh, not, not in, you know, that, that's in this number somewhere. somewhere. Uh, but, I, you know, I think we could easily take $10 million less in this issuance and go do back later when, when we would use the money. And by the way, in my opinion, and by the way, I'd probably be sitting on some, you know, 250 square foot yacht if I was uh, could actually figure it out. But I, I, I don't think we're going to see a big uptick in uh, rates. I think your feds are, gonna, uh, are not going to put any additional increases. So, I, I, I don't think that we're, uh, you know, I actually think rates are fairly high right now and, are, and can very well come down in a year or so. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so there's other reasons I think we need to look at the amount of the issuance and I just don't think we need all that money right now. Can I answer, Jim? Do you have something to answer to that, Karen? Oh, um, well, I, you know, I, I'd like to kind of finish going through the handout because I do have some comments to address a few things Jim brought up, uh, other things to consider. Um, the first part of what I wanted to talk about today was just revisiting the numbers. Um, so we talked about the courthouse. There still seems to be some confusion about the contingency. Um, staff using what we received from Gilbane is saying that there is there is not the $9.6 million contingency built into this. So we'll move down to the health department. There are small contingencies built in for construction and for on the owner um, cost. That project is newer, has a little bit more work to do. Um, I, I think we're probably going to end up spending some of that. Um, it's just, it's 1.7 million. It's not a substantial amount of money. These numbers, the new building construction, those are bid numbers. 
the existing build up, building demo, our bid numbers. Um, so if you look at this, I'm getting my information from the same place you are. Right, this is this the letter that Joel put on a cabinet now. And that one said, within the con construction cost, there are some set-aside funds. Construction, 5%. Design, 1%. Owner contingency, 2%. And for the owner's cost, like furniture and stuff, there's a 2.5% contingency, which is 10.5%, which would be 3.2 million. So how did that change? From 3.2 to 1.7, I don't know. I think you got to add them all. Like, there's four numbers on there. On this sheet that she just gave you add them all up. It's 10 percent. It's 3. Point something million. There's four different. I you're saying 1.7. So the information 1. I was given that would included bid information. I pulled the contingency numbers off of there, and the, this is what was included. 1.7 is the total of those other numbers you're looking at, not in addition to. <coughs> okay. So I, I'm confused. That's half of what Joel had in the letter we just had at the last meeting. I think we can provide you some additional support for this. We'll provide the Gilbane breakdown. We'll probably provide the health department breakdown from Leah Pardo. And I think we can move on. The information staff has, we believe that we need $64 million to finish these two projects. There's some other things to consider. Um, we need to make a decision relatively quickly. Bond pricing is, or the sale is scheduled for March 12th. Those proceeds, we have three years to spend, so that would be March of 2022. This <laughs> issuance does fit in with our long-term debt plan. Both of these projects are expected to be completed by the end of 2020. That's less than two years from now. When we issued the bonds in 2016, we hadn't even started some of that work. So having a year or two, I don't think is a lot of time to have the funds available for us. If we don't spend down the bond proceeds for the projects above, if there's contingency that we don't spend, we can consider using that for the following projects that are going to be necessary and we have not identified funding. We can use bond proceeds to pay for the EMA facility instead of using RTA dollars. We can use, can use some of that, if there is excess, for surface parking for the judges. We, we're going to have to do that and we have no plan for it at this point. Um, abatement and demolition of the old courthouse. Even if we don't tear it down, it needs to be boarded up. We'll have to do some work to it. And the ADF needs a new roof. We have lots of projects lined up. Um, if there's a small amount of money that we don't end up spending, I think we could certainly earmark it for something else. To, to address Jim's point with, with bank qualified, there's two different ways to do it. One would be, um, bank qualified where we would go through the whole process. We'd have to have the ordinance, the public hearings, everything. Um, if we're going to, these projects are going to cost us, we believe we'll need that money next summer. So we'll be doing it soon. Um, the other option is a direct bank purchase, which we can also do, and that has to be paid off in three to five years, which we cannot work into our debt plan. So here's on the bonding to, to kind of jump on what, what Jim was talking about. We did the first bond issuance in 175. We did get a premium. Yes. Victor Chang had told me at the time, I think our bonds were five percenters and four percenters, right? And at the time he told me we probably priced them a little too high. We probably should have gone with a lesser interest rate. But we didn't know at the time. We now know. And so the problem with us going for that extra money <coughs> which is kind of covering the contingency for right now is we're pricing them at 5%. If we didn't go for the premium, we could probably price them at 4%, maybe a little less. And I, mean, I haven't talked to Leslie, you guys are talking to her, but we would save a ton of interest on $58 million worth of bonds if we only took 58 million, instead of pricing at another percent and getting an, extra, an additional $6 million or $7 million. So we save on that interest, and if we don't need the, the, the money, then we've saved on the whole thing. Then we can look at the individual projects and price them accordingly. But 
Victor said the five and the four was too high. I know market conditions have changed a little bit, but maybe we could be at three and four if it wasn't for the premium. Well, the, the, the bonding we're moving forward with is the recommendation from Wells Fargo. They're recommending we stay at four and five. And that's what the market's look, the, the market's supporting at this point. Well, it certainly helps them if we take yeah. the premium to make when they make more money. So I would recommend that as a salesperson too. But are we asking the question where would we be if we just took fifty eight without a premium? What would our rate be? If it is three seven five, that, that's a hell of a savings. Is that the coupon? Yeah. We're buying 58 to get a premium of 60. Yeah, well, 60. Right. They're saying the two five is five. Which is consistent uh, well, with a lot of the bond issuances we've done. I mean, maybe not the five, not the five percent, but but four is fairly average for our other bond issuances. Even going back to the ADF bonds. Well, all, all I know is, is Victor had told us at the time the next the next bond you go. Without major market changes, we need to go lower because we probably priced them a little too high. That's why they were going to 45 minutes for 175 million. We're doing almost a third. We're doing a little less than a third of that. They could go in the same time frame, maybe if we did four. One percent does that do the calculation? But it's a lot of money over 30 years. So, so we're so yeah, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with Mike. You know. First, you should understand, you're purchasing the premium. I mean, it's not like they're giving you free money. You're paying for it because you're going to get them a higher interest rate. So they just basically, they're, they're discounting or giving a premium because of the interest you're giving them. Now, I, I've never seen the analysis of what's it, what's it cost you by purchasing, basically purchasing additional funds up front. I haven't really seen the analysis over a 20-year period, you know, what that additional 1% actually cost on that money. Uh, but, but I tend to uh, uh, lean now towards not doing the premium, because uh, I don't think we're going to need it, or, or come up with an insurance where you think, whatever you think you're going to need, I'd really have to lower interest rate. You know, I agree, we might be able to squeeze three and a half percent. But they tell you when, when, when a 5% tax exempt bond, that's over a 7% tax equivalency for high end investors. And they will buy it all. You play one guy, so I'll give you the whole, I'll give you 60 million, no problem. You know, because you know, you're dealing with people, very high worth individuals who purchase these types of things, just through a lot of private banks and so forth. But at any rate, I think we should take another look at it. Let Leslie come back. Uh, let her tell us that this is our, our, our long-term financial interest. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm really at a lower rate. I think long-term it costs us less. Should we at least get the analysis I don't think there's anybody here that that is against going out for the bond issuance to build, finish the building. I think it's extremely important. Obviously, we all know the importance. We also all know that there's an upcoming time limit. I think while she does her study, I think we should kind of narrow it down and say, you know, here's here's where the cost is. If we do the lower interest rate first, the higher. But if you take the bottom line that this uh, chart so eloquently uh, displays. To receive 55 million proceeds, we would issue 50 million amount. So let's look at the 50 million amount at the higher interest rate paid, so we get the premium, or the 55 amount with the lower interest rate where we wouldn't get the premium. And then at that time, this would be satisfactory to get us almost a completion on the majority of these projects. And if for some reason we find that we're short, then we'll go offer the 10 million uh, bank loan to just finish it up. How do you pay it back? They just said they it's not built into the schedule for those three to five years. You have to pay that back. Because we're going to no. top load. No, we would, there, there's we would two, do another two ways we would, to do that. You can do, do a regular bond issuance, or you can do a direct placement, which has to be paid in three to five years. 
So we would not be able to do the direct payment. We would not be able to do the direct payment. I, I also want to just bring to everyone's attention, this is moving. Our, our bond rating calls are scheduled for next Wednesday. So we need to make a decision. I can't do a rating call when we don't know what we're borrowing. Yeah. The last line on this sheet, I think, is, is sufficient for us to get the projects just about all complete, to be honest with you. And if we have to go out for a million or two or three at the end to finish it up, I think we'll do the bank finance it. But if you look at that bottom line, if you if you like the lower interest rate, you borrow the 55. If you want the higher interest rate, you borrow the 50. Whatever is the best, the most cost efficient for the for the county, I think I would be more than happy to approve that. And if that's your direction, I'll ask Leslie to provide that to us. But I mean, we need. We need to keep yesterday. I mean, otherwise, we're not going to meet the date for to use right. the ordinance. Okay. So, what is the consensus of this group? I, I will make a motion that um, she check with Wells Fargo uh, to find out what interest rate to get fifty-five million in proceeds. What? What can we do it at three percent, three point seven, one percent for fifty-five million? What's the most effective way of taking even fifty five hundred? Right. What's the, okay. what's the, what's the Is there a second? savings? I'll okay. I'll 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 second. I'll All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? What? Hey, can I ask when I get that information? Did okay. Denise, two rolls off. This is on Jackie's motion. Barry? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Rizalone? Yes. Harris? No. Markham? Yes. Moran? Yes. Eustis? Yes. Ogala? Yes. Summers? Yes. Trainier? Yes. And Yes. Okay. Request by the church. I just have I one more question. Oh, sorry. Um, care. When I get the information from Leslie, who will I convey that to? Is there someone that you'd like to designate? Would it be the finance chair, yourself, Madam Speaker? Uh, yeah. Yes, to both those two. Okay. I, I would I would suggest, you know, of course, uh, Mr. Harris is the finance <coughs> chair and leadership. I mean, that you know that puts the leadership there. And I think it avoids uh, some of the confusing conversations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Number six. Okay, so request by the county treasurer for broker name change. Motion. All those in favor? Aye. Wonderful. 
It's a good use of the phone. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Just a question or a comment. Be sure to ask us for the snowblower. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. Back shot. It's in the it's yeah. Actually, it's in the um, yeah. Now that it's passed, I'll speak freely. I just want to get that passed. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be uh, coming back to the board to request a resolution to raise the number of deputy correctional officers by two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, the next meeting. Okay, the next one is a discussion of many of the classifications of the liquor licenses, Jim. Um, just sort of a follow-up, uh, after our last meeting, uh, the State's Attorney's Office and I have been working together. There was, I think, uh, some direction regarding a new classification in terms of agro-tourism. And so we just had some discussion like uh, yesterday afternoon in terms of uh, putting something together that would tie in with our uh, existing land use ordinance, which provides agro-tourism in the uh, the agricultural district and I think there was also some direction in terms of adding perhaps a package classification a new classification which would only be beer and wine uh, if that's the direction we'll work together yeah I, I, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was why I was yeah, the reason yeah. behind that was is if you're going into a gas station you're picking up package you're picking up a case of beer or picking up bottles of wine. We do have issues where people are picking up a pint of liquor and going to the car and drinking it. So this would kind of stop that and, and I think we also could have like one of our one of our uh, uh, local gas stations that's looking to get a liquor license would be amenable to doing a beer and wine only. So and I think that would be a good way to go for the future. And so that's a, that is just for discussion. And Jim, are you going to have some for the uh, next month? Yeah, I, you know, we, we look at the Homer, uh, you know, because we have an existing uh, use, the Kono uh, operation. We've looked at that, you know, we've uh, collaborated with them. And uh, Mary and I will work together uh, in terms of bringing something more, you know, um, specific but uh, <coughs> you know that operation if we model that for that operation you know doesn't provide package it's a full bar type of operation uh, that allows it on the premises it, it doesn't restrict it to a building like with our traditional liquor licenses um, so uh, you know that's sort of what we're using as a, as a rough model but we'll tie it into our land use ordinance uh, because the home were sort of sitting out there and they had things like uh, only crafts of wine and pitchers of beer which I don't think was part of our uh, direction. Right. I, I just had a question about this definition sheet. I'm guessing that's what this is. Why we would have in a liquor ordinance discussion uh, information about a farmer's market unless you're going to tell me, I'm sure, that we're going to allow wine sampling or selling at a farmer's market. No. Well, I, I passed this out because I think we need to have more clarification of what the court wants. Thank you. What you have is our land use ordinance. This is our zoning for agritourism. And it is broken down into these subcategories. So part of the clarification I'm looking for is do we really want an overarching agritourism liquor license, or are we only looking to have for some of the subcategories? Because we already have a category of liquor license, for example, for restaurants, which is one of the uses under agritourism um, is a restaurant. It would seem to me that they would just get the restaurant liquor license for. Um, the also, you know, for the, like the wine tasting, um, we already have a liquor category for wine tasting. But what I think, and, I, and I'm looking for some confirmation, what I think that the county board members were looking for was to address really the rural events, which are like the wedding barns, the event barns, 
and host weddings, and maybe we need a, a, a category, a liquor license for that type of use. I'm not sure also if you were looking for, like under the, the um, agritainment, um, which you might also want. So, so I was looking for some clarification, and maybe we do liquor licenses for those subcategories, but not for agritourism generally. Mm -hmm. Sounds like there might be more help for us in terms of looking at businesses and who gets what. Agritourism is free. Okay. You know, I, I think you bring up a really good point here, Mary, is, is that on one hand, we basically have a banquet business, right? That it's really, you can say, how connected it is to agritourism. I, I don't make the connection necessarily uh, outside of you in a, a rural setting for your wedding. But if you're inside a building, you know, you're inside a building, and I mean, or if it's an outside wedding, I, I suppose they can make a difference to wander around. The way. So, I mean, there's that portion. Uh, but then there's also what I would call, uh, uh, maybe a legacy or historical use of agritourism, where you would actually go and see what maybe a working farm was like, where maybe they make, you know, you would have uh, cider or wine or, or so. I guess uh, my question would be, does one license for agritourism fit all? Or should there be different types of, should there be one that's basically more like a commercial use, like having any bar or whatever, or banquet hall? So that's a license to have banquets and events. <coughs> And then the other would be like, you know what, if you want to, you know, to allow them to, for example, to make cider on site, to show how it would be made, they sell some cider or sample cider. So, you know, I, I do, do believe uh, uh, there could be more than one type of license application for agriculture. Okay, that's, that's basically the, the clarification I was looking for, is that you do want that. And then, um, you know, in addition, um, you know, like if you looked at the Homer Glen example, it provides that there would be a lot of liquor, liquor consumption on the, the parcel of premises. So I just want the county board members to think about what a parcel is under the agricultural. It could be, you know, dozens or maybe even 100 acres do you want, really want people walking around their entire space, some of which might be a working farm? Um, you know, you're going to have weddings maybe in the evening. Do you want to confine the liquor service and consumption to a, a more limited area, not the entire parcel? Those are some of the questions that I was thinking about as I was looking at this. So Mary, so Mary, it may be helpful for you then as members <laughs> think about what they might individually want. If they put that into an email and send those over so we forward that information to you, then from that you could call out what the types of licenses would be as subsets of agritourism rather than the umbrella. Does that sound like what people might want? Can I one other follow-up question? Answer first. Would that work? Sure. Yeah. Okay. No, I would, I'm very, very interested to hear what the what the committee has in mind. Thank you. And the only other follow-up, Mary, is to another, uh, uh, responding to what you just said. For example, uh, I, I went to Kurt applicant and wants the ability to go anywhere on this property. You know, I have like golf carts going around so they can win her or whatever. Uh, uh, so I, I do think it's also important is, you know, uh, uh, that that be restricted to a certain geographic area. You know, like I said, if you got a 200 acre farm, it's like, okay, you want to water around the 200 acres and drink you know, or so. Well, I, I shouldn't even say that drink. That you would have the ability to sell liquor anywhere on that farm. I suppose there's a difference about where you can drink it and where you can sell it. So, so, so it's always hard to restrict where people are going to but it's not hard to define 
where you're going to sell it. Well, so, yeah. so I think that's okay, maybe so, another way of approaching it. Yeah. So, so am I understanding that you want it, you know, maybe in a structure or a building is where the liquor can be sold from? You have to be able to control, and any liquor commissioner, and Jim, you can jump in on this, you know, out, 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 the liquor commissioner, I think we do the enforcement. You know, you have to have some type of control mechanism on where liquor is being sold. You may not always be able to control or even want to control where they can drink it, but you don't want them to say, well, they're out walking around. You don't want to, you don't want, in my opinion, you don't want to create a golf course situation where people right. can buy the liquor over the whole golf course. Right. Well, and, and, you know, maybe, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, maybe um, in some of these instances, maybe, a, well, I don't know how feasible. Well, let me talk to Jim about that, because I'm saying maybe a plan as to where liquid could be concerned. I'll, I'll tell you what one of my concerns is, if, and, and I'm not talking about one specific development here. We have a couple of different barns that are going to be used for events, you know, that are presently in the county. Um, but you're having a wedding. It's in the evening. It's dark. People have a tendency to overindulge. And then you have people who are wandering off maybe into a cornfield. Do we want that situation? I mean, are, or are we going to have some sort of a limitation on where people can be while they're even consuming the liquor? I don't know. I don't know if that's your intent, and I'll lose well, obviously. But I, I think we need to think about it. Certainly, you have to be able to control where it's sold. Yes. You can't control it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, for instance, um, and I would imagine the sheriffs will be thinking the same thing. If we have rodeos out there, and I'm thinking that would probably be one of the things we wouldn't want to. In my opinion, local residents would not support that. They already are. They already deal with the impact of all the additional people parking for the day on the rodeo, let alone that selling the liquor there. I'm sure you might kind of leave. I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming they bring liquor there already. So I don't know if that would be one thing that would be, you know. Glaring at me right now to say probably that the area we would not want to do it. Um, so I have a question. Let's let's say the property owner is taking five acres of their land and, and creating this business in a bar. Uh, should, we, should we consider is that truly agriculture anymore? Would, would well, we I have think that's why is it a rezoning that? Well, that's, that's why they have this zoning for agritourism. So, so that's what it is. What you have in front of you is the new zoning ordinance for agritourism, which takes into consideration that it is, it has a historical agricultural feel to it, but it is in fact now being used for a more commercial type enterprise. So, I, when I was surprised when I saw the structure because everyone calls it a but it doesn't look like a Well, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caution you against focusing in on one property because, as I said, we have several yeah. different properties that are looking at um, and wedding and barn type uh, situations. And I just, Thanks. I guess I, I'm just asking for clarification. We're, lot, we're asking or discussing about getting a license to someone and licensing, not necessarily use permits or a special no. use permit. So I think we need to make sure that this is actually something that's a licensure that we're getting a discussion sure. about. We, we so are. So they were talking about having a liquor license for agritourism uses. So I brought the zoning uses so you understood what the agritourism uses are. And perhaps all of those uses don't lend themselves to a liquor classification or a liquor permit. And and part of the clarification I'm looking for is I am looking for a liquor classification for an overarching agritourism or are you looking for a classification to deal with agritainment or a classification for rural events as subcategories under the agritourism. But you wouldn't necessarily want a liquor license for every single use. Yeah, yeah. And so that was my question. Um, if we do the agritourism license, if I understood what Denise asked earlier, we can just pick 
some of these 11 subcategories. We do not have to approve them all. Correct. Okay. Because I picked my three. <laughs> As did I. <laughs> so what I'm going to ask people to do is to um, ask each of you to do is you have the sheet in front of you shows our overall agritourism category and it shows what the subsets are. So I'm going to ask you to look through those, get an understanding by reading them, what they are, look on the land use website if you don't, and then give them that information, share by email with the caucus leaders with me what your preference is so we can share that as one with Mary so that she has that body of information and Jim to talk about, begin to craft language and to know what it is we want as a board. So. Yes, um, I wanted to just also say that if we did for some reason do an overarching one, I wanted to, I guess, have Jim weigh in on, and it, it came down to like a restaurant one, we could, could we, I guess, advise each applicant, because these would only be people who had the special use of agritourism to begin with. So then let's say they had a restaurant on there, it might be more prudent for us to advise them to get a restaurant liquor license anyway, even right. if this was an umbrella. I mean, would that be correct that we right. could prioritize which license would be most uh, And that's, that's yeah. part of the clarification. I don't know that if they are using it as a restaurant that they would have an agritourism type liquor license, they would get the restaurant license we already have on the books. Right. So even if this was overarching, though, is my point, is it may not ever come down to that, you know, if that's the decide, we say, yes, all 12 of these should be applicable, but then when they go to apply, they may not be applying for that particular license if one already exists that makes more sense. Correct. Just want to be clear about that. So, Mary, do you need something else from us? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you, Mary. I'll skip the electronic meeting. Just turn my report You will now. all get the, um, the information in your email so that you can have it electronically. Okay. Uh, authorizing the county executive to execute a letter of understanding between the county of Page, the county of Will for Watershed Planning. Motion. All in favor? Aye. Authorize the county executive on the sublease for CED. Oh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yeah. All right. Uh, authorize the county executive at GA with uh, relays fire protection. Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? IGA for um, <coughs> Monique. Move. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? IGA rebuilds your playing field on the radio Move. system. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? IGA with Manhattan fire protection. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Replacement hires for Sunny Hill. Move. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Sunny Hill with Garen. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Replacement hire pre posting for land uses for the building inspector. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And I'm going to be adding uh, or saving space for the road maintainer for the uh, transport highway department. Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right. Can we have proclamations? Yeah, the uh, three proclamations. Uh, one's a check presentation to after the Peanut Foundation. Denise will do that. Uh, I, not the second and third one, the second one uh, honoring Catholic, Joy Catholic Academy Class 5A State Football Championship, Gloria Dollinger, and uh, she will do the other one, uh, Joy Catholic Class 1A champion, uh, competitive dance team championship. And then we have appointments by the county executive. Hello. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have, uh, Mary, do we have anything for you from the state's attorney's opinion? We do have everything. Okay. Uh, we have a committee report.